So, please, gentlemen. Please be seated. The king will not arrive. Good morning. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this press conference in the session hall of the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences. Uh, delighted that all of you have come, and I'm sure you're eager to meet this year's Nobel laureates and ask them questions. So let me just first introduce our new laureates. Next to me is Professor Duncan Haldane from Princeton University in the USA, and next to him, Professor Michael Kosterlitz from Brown University, also of the USA. Uh, professors Haldane and Kosterlitz are this year's Nobel laureates in physics. Uh, Professor David Thaulus uh, is not participating in the press conference uh, due to health reasons, but he will be, he is here and will participate in the prize award ceremony. Uh, then we have, next to Professor Kostelitz, our three Nobel laureates in chemistry, Professor Jean-Pierre Sauvage, uh, Sir Fraser Stoddart, and Professor Ben Ferinka from Strasbourg, um, Northwestern University near Chicago, and the University of Groningen in the Netherlands. And then, last but not least, the laureates of the Sveriges Riksbank Prize in Economic Sciences, Professor Oliver Hart of uh, Harvard University, and Professor Bengt Holmström of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. My name is Joran Hansen, I'm the Secretary General of the Academy. So, the idea is, you ask questions, we have not prepared any statements or speeches, so it's your uh, show. Who would like to start? Please. Uh, I would like to... If you could state your name, please. Yes, my name is Johan Schick from Dagens Nyheter in Stockholm. Um, I would like to ask the economic laureates uh, what you think about uh, uh, the economic policies as far as we know at the moment of uh, Donald Trump. I know that uh, Professor Hart has had strong opinions before and I guess that uh, Professor Holmström has some opinions as well. <laughs> Thank you, Bengt, for letting, for letting me go first. Um, I have spoken about uh, my views about Donald Trump's economic policies. Uh, let me just uh, briefly tell you what they are again. Um, I don't think his policy, well, of course, things change every day, but I don't see yet a coherent set of policies. Um, so it's, it's very hard to know what he's going to do. The things he talked about during the campaign were worrying to me, the idea of tearing up trade agreements, imposing tariffs. I, I don't think that's the way forward um, for the US uh, or the world. Um, and while it may be true that we want to help um, those who have suffered from globalization or automation, people who've lost their jobs, lost good jobs, I think there are uh, much better ways of doing it than than those ways. Um, he also uh, said he w wanted to cut taxes on uh, on the rich. Um, his um, candidate for Treasury Secretary has now um, gone back on that or, or uh, uh, expressed a different view that while you should cut marginal tax rates at the top, you should also reduce deductions so that actually um, the rich would, would not be better off. But I don't know whether that actually represents Donald Trump's views or just Mr. Mnookin's views. So um, again, judging by what Trump said, which was to give tax breaks to the rich, um, that seemed to me to be going in the opposite direction from what we wanted, which is right now I would be in favor of actually increasing the tax burden on, on the wealthy. Um, 
And then, of course, there's also the issue of, of uh, um, how one is going to fund the budget deficit because he wanted to do infrastructure spending, which is something I am actually sympathetic to, although when you look at the details um, of what he had in mind, those are not so um, impressive. But uh, increasing infrastructure spending, which may be good because a lot of the infrastructure is in bad shape, uh, but then also reducing taxes. I mean, that's going to lead to all sorts of budgetary problems in the future. So, so let me stop there. Does any, Dr. Holmström or, or any of the other laureates have any additional comments? Let me say something. This is not uh, my field of expertise, uh, and I, I take a little different tack in the sense that uh, uncertainty is never good. So we are nervous about, uh, about that. Uh, but I would rather see what actually happens and when he gets going, what he's doing because he has changed his mind many times over. And, uh, and even the Democrats said, let's see what happens. I think it is a danger to, to be very critical necessarily before the game has even started. And he will learn that um, actions that he's planning to do are not doable for some of, for, for various reasons uh, to the extent and with the speed he's planning to do it. So that's where I would like to stop. It's not, uh, if, if, if things get implemented the way Oliver uh, suggested, I, I would uh, share most of Oliver's views that I'm, I'm, I'm I would not agree with those policies. On the other hand, there is an element that doesn't get mentioned, which is that we have been in a, in a sort of, in a state of rut uh, for quite a while in the world, and, and stagnant, uh, low interest rates, uh, you know, a word we haven't had an easy time understanding. And it is interesting to see I think his uh, policies uh, are going to, one way or another, shake the equilibrium, as we say it. That is, I, I think something will happen that's different from, uh, from what we have seen in the last eight years. Now, it could be something very bad, but there is the possibility also, I think, that there could be something good, especially with regard to the investments in infrastructure. Thank you. Are there additional comments? If not, let's move on to the next question. The lady over there, if you could introduce yourself. Yes. Uh, I'm Corina Negra from Radio Romania Science Department, and I have two questions for Professor uh, Holmstrom. First of all, I, um, you recently criticized the Finnish government for cutting the funds for education. The government said, okay, we, uh, we've no, we, we took notice and we will make some changes. First of all, if you, uh, do you expect the funds to grow up again? And secondly, what do you think are the consequences of uh, cutting funds for education in Finland? And secondly, uh, you are also a product of, let's say, Finnish school. Is Finnish school best too? <laughs> I'm thinking okay. about the, the recent PISA uh, classification. Thank you. The Finnish school has been very good, yes. But, uh, but, uh, as some of my resources would suggest, it has maybe lo been lopsided. That is, they learn to, to read and write and, and they wrote the arithmetic, as we call it, but not necessarily communication skills and broader skills. And, and uh, that's a worry with all kinds of measuring tests. So that's an example of the kind of theory I'm thinking about. So uh, yes, the Finnish school is, uh, is good, but uh, I think there's not re no reason to be uh, very comfortable with it, especially with regard to adapting oneself to a more, uh, uh, more uh, volatile world and, and, and uh, where communication skills and, and presentation skills are important. On the cutting Finnish taxes, I think it's such a detailed question, but yes, I, I would not, uh, cutting support for the <coughs> education, I, I, I was certainly not supportive of that. Hmm? Yeah. Okay. I think we I, have to move on. Thank you. Please, the gentleman over there. Um, David Keaton from the Associated Press. This will be a question to all the laureates. Um, now, more than 2,000 scientists, including many Nobel laureates, have signed a letter calling on the US government, also President-elect Trump, 
uh, to make use of scientific evidence, to use scientific evidence in, uh, in policy making. In this time where we are th facing global challenges, both on the medical, on, on the uh, climate front, uh, but also in this period where, we, where we're talking today about the post-truth era, what role can science play? And are you not concerned that uh, science is maybe losing uh, its place and its appeal um, amongst the wider population who might not be walking the corridors of our great universities? Who would like to start here? Dr. Ferinja? I like this question a lot because I think it is a serious worry. I recently heard I learned that people were saying our oh, science is also only an opinion. And this is scaring. And I agree, fully agree we should do a better job in this and emphasizing more what the role of science in education is to bring forward facts and to distinguish it from fiction and to make it possible to have new opportunities for the future based on solid science. And I think that is a big task for the whole scientific community to bring this forward to the politicians, but in particularly to the general audience, yes. Thank you for this question. Any additional comments on the topic? I, I just want to, Please. Um, I <coughs> concur with everything that uh, my colleague uh, Ben Ferenga has said. Uh, I'd just like to add that um, I think we should emphasize um, the uh, importance of science uh, for the uh, young generation. Um, I had the opportunity last week to interact with uh, young people um, in and around the White House before uh, a party of us, uh, some of us at this table, uh, four of us in fact, uh, met with uh, <coughs> President Obama. And um, in the preliminary meetings it was clear that there was a lot of anxiety about uh, the future amongst the Obama staff. Uh, but I tried to put forward a very positive message that uh, come what may, and we don't know what is coming, um, the future is going to be very bright. Um, that um, <coughs> the uh, situation in the US uh, could be much shorter, if I might make a comparison with the one that's going to hit the United Kingdom, perhaps under so-called hard Brexit. Um, the uh, situation there could be, in chemical terminology, quite irreversible, whereas in the United States uh, one can look at a situation where a president uh, can uh, be in office for obviously minimally four years, uh, maybe even less if something else happened. And uh, <clears throat> I think the situation is that uh, we don't know what's going to happen in the United States in relation to science, as in economics. Uh, we've heard many different uh, comments from uh, the uh, Trump camp. And we have to wait and see uh, what actually happens in real life. Um, in the intervening period, I think uh, we should move ahead in the spirit of I can just take the chemistry prize this year of uh, the fact that um, it has been given to fundamental science. And uh, that is what I think myself and my two colleagues are going to preach uh, uh, at this uh, particular time in Stockholm and beyond that um, we are absolutely delighted that it is fundamental science that is being recognized this year. Thank you. Any additional comments? Then we're ready to take the next question. Who's in line? Please, Maria. My, I'm Maria Gunther from Dagens Nyheter. I have a more personal question to all the laureates. Uh, what did you donate to the Nobel Museum and why? Please, Dr. Aldeid. I donated an old paper of mine that had been missing for a long time because uh, it never got published. <laughs> and uh, luckily, uh, someone who had had it as a preprint and worked on it managed to find it and return it to me. <laughs> to announce the, uh, it was giving the first uh, report of some of the work which I got this prize for. Dr. Kostelitz. Some handwritten notes, which we managed, which my wife managed to find uh, from the garbage, because a few months ago she insisted that I clear out the study, so everything, everything got thrown away. However, the few pages of handwritten notes got were rescued, and the other item I donated was 
uh, something very used to be very close to my heart is a, a, a rock climbing guide to North Wales because I used to spend half my time sitting on, on cliffs in North Wales uh, uh, and then the other half of my time I would spend either sleeping or uh, thinking about physics. <laughs> Thank you. Professor Savage. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Uh, well, I gave my notes of um, uh, research projects, handwritten notes, uh, which I presented to my group, because every year we used to have a, a special seminar uh, at the beginning of the academic year to present the, the projects uh, and the past projects, you know, to know where, where we were. Uh, that was um, written on uh, October 7, 1982, so relatively old, respectably old. Um, and in addition, I gave the, the first publication on the project, which appeared a year later. And that was, I think, the first practical synthesis of a catenane, and I take the liberty to show you, you know, what a catenane is, two interlocking rings molecular structure that's become <clears throat> very famous in recent yeah. months. So, Fraser. Um, <clears throat> so, if I can use the cliche, um, it's said that um, uh, a picture is worth a thousand words. So, I decided on that basis that maybe uh, models um, of <clears throat> chemical compounds might be worth 10,000 words. So, I took models that I have used since about the same era the mid-1980s to demonstrate uh, catenation, the formation of catenanes, and then the other mechanically interlocked molecule that has uh, received a lot of attention, the so-called rotaxane. And so if I describe this briefly, it is based on a dumbbell. This is the kind of entity that weightlifters would lift uh, at the Olympic Games or some such place. Um, and then it is surrounded by one ring, uh, which can in the case of the example I've given to uh, the um, Nobel Foundation, the Nobel Museum, uh, the ring can jump from uh, one recognition site to another, and this is the basis for a molecular switch. Um, <clears throat> you might be interested to know, parenthetically, that uh, I was able to uh, put these together, not with my own hands, but with a very excellent workshop at the University of Sheffield in the wake of the period that uh, the late Sir George Porter, who was a Nobel laureate back in, I think, um, I better not say a date precisely, about the 1960s, um, but he also ran a television series uh, on BBC television, and this demanded, on, on the laws of thermodynamics, by the way, and this demanded that he needed a very good workshop, so I was very fortunate to be able to uh, be in the wake of uh, his uh, providing the chemistry department at Sheffield with this facility. My last comment is I gave a third article, and that is a book that myself and uh, our ex-graduate student Carson Bruns, now Miller Research Fellow in Berkeley, had written on, um, I quote, the nature of the mechanical bond, which is a play on Pauling's The Nature of the Chemical Bond, published in 1939, and the subtitle is From Molecules to Machines. And it is a sheer coincidence that this book was published on the 7th of November, sort of halfway between the announcement on the 5th of October and the days that we're sitting here. Thank you. Professor Ferenka. Thank you very much. I gave three small items to the Noble Museum. The first one was a pair of small wooden shoes. <laughs> and that's not because I'm from the Netherlands, or maybe it is. But my whole scientific life, I've been struggling with distinguishing left and right. <laughs> and you know, when you want to make a rotary motor, you have to rotate either clockwise or counterclockwise, otherwise you don't have a motor. So that's distinguished between left and right. And when I grew up on the farm as a small boy, we had these small wooden shoes. And uh, when you make the mistake to put your foot, your right foot in the left wooden shoe, it hurts so much that for the rest of your life you know what the distinction is between <laughs> left and right. The second object I gave was a replica that we built of the first electric car in this world. And it was built by Sibrande Strating, a professor in our department in 1835, because electrolysis has just been invented. And he built with an electrolysis cell 
an electric car and the replica has just arrived in the museum <laughs> yesterday evening, I think. And the third item I gave is a small vial with a little bit of white powder. And it contains one billion times one billion of identical molecular rotary motors. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Hart. Yes. Well, thank you. Um, so, economists, uh, like chemists, also deal with models, but our models are a, a little bit different, and they're sort of mathematical, and it's hard to give them to somebody. So I didn't attempt to give a model, um, but instead I gave a copy of um, the, I think the only book I've written so far, uh, well, I'm sure it is, uh, which was published in 1995, um, called Firms, Contracts, and Financial Structure, which um, uh, came out of the some lectures I gave at Oxford University called the Clarendon Lectures. And anyway, this the, one of the reasons for giving this book is it does summarize um, the work for which I have been awarded the prize, the main work. Um, a lot of it was before 1995, and so the 1995 1995 book is an attempt to make that work a little bit more accessible to, I wouldn't say exactly to the world, but at least to people who are studying economics. Uh, I have done some more work since then, which is obviously not in that book, but the, the book is a, a pretty reasonable account of, of much of the work, and so I thought that was a, a reasonable thing to, to give, and that's, that's what I did. Thank you. Professor Armstrong. Uh, I'm very fond of uh, games in general uh, and board games and uh, the part of economics that uh, I work on is a part of game theory or relies on game theory. So I thought a, a game that I'm fond of called Go, which is a chess-like game but uh, more, more sophisticated in many ways. A simpler and more sophisticated old Chinese game. So I gave a, a, the board that I used in 90, 1985 to play with my colleague from Stanford and Mike Harrison, who introduced me to the game, and, and that wasted one sabbatical year, but we had a lot of fun. And maybe it was uh, cre caused cre me to be more creative afterwards. Thank you. I'm sure all our East Asian visitors to the Mel Museum will will <coughs> appreciate finding a go game there. We have time for two more questions. The lady over here. Hi, my name is Spencer Baumholt. I'm with Echo Radio Sweden, the English desk. Uh, congratulations to you all. And this question is for each of you. Um, what can we do to promote more women in your respective fields and have them be successful within those? Thank you. OK, who would like to start? Dr. Holdain? Well, I think you know, in physics, it's a big problem. And the only solution is on the graduate student level, we need to, we, we're doing our best to uh, train and put out there in good careers uh, some of the really good women that we can find to do physics. I think it's a great, there's a great opportunities in physics for, for women and we have to do everything to prevent people dropping out because of family issues and, and uh, we do the best we can right now, but the, really the only long-term solution is at the graduate student level. Otherwise, universities like Princeton are just stealing the, the, the few very uh, uh, top women scientists, just stealing them from the other places, and uh, it's not increasing the pool. So the only solution is graduate students. Mm -hmm. More comments on this important topic? Professor Sauvage? Many women in science. I think they, there is a proportion of something like 40% or so. Um, it comes to discrimination if you look at the top positions. Top positions are mostly male. Uh, but uh, I mean, just I wanted to, to make it clear that there are many, many women in science. Uh, this is also true in South Europe, in Spain and in Italy. Yeah. But hopefully, you know, they will reach the highest level and uh, be equal to men in terms of numbers. Yeah. This is an, a very important uh, issue. In recent years in the field of chemistry, at least in our country, 
and then also uh, some other countries in Europe, I see an increasing number of young girls going into studying chemistries. I was recently in China for a couple of weeks, and it's amazing how many girls you find there in the chemistry departments. We uh, have also uh, special programs where we try to, uh, where only women can apply, the so-called Rosalind Franklin professorships. And then you create role models, and that is really important to show the kids in schools uh, that women can make a real a career in science. And uh, then very recently, we established in our, because we are here in the Academy of Science, we have in our next round of election, only female candidates can be, can be nominated for the next round. We'll see what it will do. Mr. Fraser. Maybe I can start by putting a more personal spin on this uh, question, which I think is an excellent one. Um, I happen to be the father of uh, two daughters, both of whom have PhDs in chemistry. Uh, <coughs> one from Imperial College London, my elder daughter, and the other from the University of Durham, having taken her first degree at Cambridge University. Uh, my elder daughter at the moment has stepped out of uh, first-line uh, activity in science, but I'm sure that uh, in a few years' time, uh, when she's stopped traveling the world for various reasons involving her husband's uh, work um, as a <coughs> uh, production chemist uh, with uh, Takeda in Japan, um, I'm sure she will return. At the moment, she does a lot of uh, social work um, related to schools and uh, so forth. My other daughter um, has been... Um, through the Royal Society of Chemistry into the Nature Publishing Group, and just recently this year, she was appointed as the first uh, um, founding editor of uh, a review journal in the physical sciences. It's called uh, Nature Reviews Materials. And so you may ask how this happened, and I would like to say it wasn't because the Stoddard family preached uh, science or chemistry at breakfast, lunch, and dinner. It was simply that coming back to Ben Faringa's comment, they found role models. And they found role models in people like Jean-Pierre Sauvage. Uh, my daughter has spent time with his family um, <clears throat> and with Ben Faringa. And, and, and so role modeling is important. Uh, moving on from the family situation, if I may, just briefly, um, <clears throat> I am very vigorous uh, in my uh, pushing for women in science. And I note the same uh, phenomenon that uh, I think has been alluded to by both my co-laureates here in chemistry. We do very well uh, at the bachelor's level, and we do excellent uh, work in terms of numbers at the PhD level. The, the uh, big challenge comes in having these same people, if we talk about academia, go on to be the equivalent of assistant professors. And we need to put on much more effort into uh, supporting uh, women to go into these positions. Um, and the same could be said of uh, the industrial research scene as well. So that, that's where the effort needs to go. And um, I think we should go there, but probably without putting um, rules and regulations in place, because I have found in uh, interacting with uh, women for nominating them for prizes, the very best women quite rightly say, I don't want to be mentioned as uh, uh, the first woman that might be nominated for this prize. No, I want to uh, compete fairly with all the other people, many of them men, of course, in, in, in line for the prize uh, without uh, being uh, held up as uh, being a woman. So th there's always a bit of a kickback, I find, from the woman uh, herself. We're running short of time, but I promised the lady over there a last uh, quick question. Um, yes, um, my name is Louise Sandrin Mate, and I work for the Swedish newspaper Svenska Dagbladet. Um, my question is a bit coming back to where we started um, the discussion about coming from Donald Trump and coming from Brexit. Um, I would like to know how concerned are you um, about the political situation that we're in at the moment? Um, we have lots of elections coming next year in Europe, and. Um, um, I mean, the question is to all of you, and I, I know, for example, that you, Mr. Hart, have spoken about that your greatest concern after the U.S. election is not the economic um, impacts, but uh, an increase of racism in, in the U.S. society. Thank you. Are the quick answers to the long question? Professor Hart. Why don't we 
racism. Let me just say another angle than the racism is that I think uh, right now we have representative uh, governance under big attack all around the world, is my view. That is something is happening, the population doesn't seem to care about the, their representatives and they try to reach directly into some strong-willed man or woman who can lead the country and that, uh, that is an ominous development. Uh, which I, I, I think is uh, reminiscent of 100 years ago, and I'm extremely worried about that. I think the democracy is under attack. That? Yeah, please. Well, okay, so I think I've already expressed my views a bit on this one. I, I do want to just say a, a little bit about the previous question. Can I do it? Because I didn't get to that. I, I think uh, I want to... Um, emphasize what uh, Bernard Feringa said about role models. I think in economics, uh, I mean, the best way to get more women into economics is to have more women in economics. I mean, once you have um, a, 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 reason, a, a good number of women as faculty members, then it's going to be much more, much easier and, and much more attractive for younger women to um, do PhDs and become faculty members themselves. So it's a sort of chicken and egg situation. I also think that we need to uh, listen more to, to what women have to say about the difficulties they face, because you often find when you when you talk to them that you know they experience some form of discrimination that you're not aware of, or you may be treating women differently, or something like that. And if 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 there's more communication. Um, then we can find out what it is that, they've, that they feel would improve their situation. So I think there are all sorts of things we can do. But I'm, I'm sorry that I <laughs> didn't quite answer your question, but I, ha I, I want to emphasize that the, certainly the, um, the fact that a lot of people in the U.S. Um, are feeling under threat, Muslims, uh, Jews, um, immigrants, all sorts of people, um, feel that that um, you know some, uh, the, the Trump has unleashed some bad elements in the US and there's been an increase in hate crimes and this to me is all extremely worrying. Dr. Ferenhard, would you like just a short comment? Yeah, you see, I'm not a polit in politics, but you see this kind of division, retreating uh, and dividing. If there's one thing that we as scientists community can do is to bring forward the importance of a global community. We speak the same language. We don't care about borders. We have common goals with perspectives for the future for our youth. And that is what we should bring forward instead of dividing. And I think this unity of scientists, scholars all over the world, inspiring the young, youth, the youth of this world, I think that is where we can contribute and more than ever these days, I would say. Thank you very much. That, I think, is an excellent way of concluding this press conference. Thank you very much for your interest. There will be individual interviews for those who have requested it. And you are very welcome to Aula Magna at Stockholm University tomorrow for the Nobel Lectures. Thank you very much. <laughs>